terrifying images out of India. Surveillance video shows the moment a pedestrian bridge packed with people starts to sway and then collapses. Hundreds of people fell into the river below. At least 130 people were killed. More than 175 survivors pulled from the water, and still more are missing. Nine people are now under arrest in connection with that tragedy. A suspect search for Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Tonight, investigators say the man accused of breaking into her home and attacking her husband, Paul, had planned to take the Speaker hostage and, quote, break her kneecaps. Federal charges that suspect is now facing. Speaker Pelosi's latest statement and Paul Pelosi's current condition. A crowd crush in South Korea kills more than 150 people during a Halloween celebration in Seoul. Two American college students are among the dead. Questions now about why there were only 137 officers on duty to manage a crowd of more than 100,000 people. What led to the massive surge as we hear from the father of one of the victims tonight. An important day in the Supreme Court as they boast the most diverse group of justices and the most conservative court in U.S. history. They were hearing two cases challenging affirmative action in higher education. Critics say it discriminates against white and Asian American applicants at two institutions. Others say this could be a disadvantage for students of color. Going green doesn't have to come to an end when our time on Earth does. The afterlife can be a process that starts with giving back to our planet, an in-depth look at green burials. Is it as simple, then, as just going back to the Earth? Nothing else is done. Absolutely. It's as simple as picking up a shovel and opening a gravesite. And tackling race politics and black culture with humor. Amanda Seals is speaking up and speaking out with her new stand-up, My Conversation with the Activist, about representing women of color in comedy. It's about being able to let my multi-hyphenate flag wave in as many spaces as possible. So for me, what's next is just a greater access at being able to be creative without having to do so much convincing in order to get access to the space. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with new details in the politically motivated attack on Paul Pelosi, the husband of Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, whom she calls Pop. New federal court documents show officials believe the suspect had an even more nefarious plan. The federal complaint was unsealed today and indicates 42-year-old David DePap wanted to take Nancy Pelosi hostage and interrogate her, and if she lied, he wanted to break her kneecaps as a lesson to Democrats. Tonight, he's facing federal charges of attempted kidnapping of a U.S. official and a slew of other charges, including the attempted murder of Paul Pelosi. Of course, Nancy Pelosi was not at her San Francisco home in the early morning hours last Friday. Her 82-year-old husband was. The suspect allegedly kept asking, where's Nancy? San Francisco police arrived eight minutes after DePat broke into the house, found the two men struggling over a hammer. Paul Pelosi was able to talk with investigators from the hospital this weekend. Tonight, he remains hospitalized, recovering from his injuries. All of this comes as we are just eight days away from the midterm elections, and elected officials are facing a growing number of threats on the job. Our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas will have more on that in just a moment. But first, Mola Lange leads us off tonight from San Francisco. Tonight, federal authorities detailing a shocking, politically motivated hammer attack on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul, that fractured his skull. According to the affidavit, 42-year-old David DePap telling police that he was going to hold Nancy hostage and talk to her. And if she lied, he was going to break her kneecaps. DePap allegedly describing the speaker as the, quote, leader of the pack of what he said were lies told by the Democratic Party. DePap also later explained that by breaking Nancy's kneecaps, she would then have to be wheeled into Congress, which would show other members of Congress there were consequences to actions. DePap now facing federal charges of assault on an immediate family member of a federal official and attempted kidnapping of a federal official. And late today in San Francisco, authorities here announcing additional charges. The charges that we are filing today include attempted murder, residential burglary, assault with a deadly weapon, elder abuse, false imprisonment of an elder, as well as threats to a public official and their family. The federal affidavit claiming DePap told police that he broke into the house through a glass door early Friday. DePap stated that Pelosi was in bed and appeared surprised, adding he told Pelosi to wake up and that he was looking for Nancy. Moments later, at 2.23 a.m., according to the affidavit, Pelosi was able to go into the bathroom, which is when he was able to call 911. We asked the district attorney about that call. How, how significant was it that Mr. Pelosi was able 
to get away for that moment and call 911. Um, I truly believe, based on what I know, that it was life-saving. According to the affidavit, DePap had zip ties, tape, rope, and at least one hammer with him that morning. The evidence further shows that DePap assaulted Mr. Pelosi with DePap's own hammer. When the police uh, responded that the front door was opened, um, both men were holding on to one end of the hammer. There was an order to drop the web, drop the hammer once the police realized what they were holding. Um, the suspect then pulled it away and that's when he attacked him with it. And DePaps questioned to Paul Pelosi, according to sources, where's Nancy? Eerily similar to the chants made by the mob that attacked the Capitol on January 6th. Nancy! Oh, Nancy! Political leaders on both sides of the aisle condemning the attack. Former Vice President Mike Pence, who was in the Capitol on January 6th, along with Speaker Pelosi, tweeting, This is an outrage, and there can be no tolerance for violence against public officials or their families. This man should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell tweeting, He's horrified and disgusted, adding he's grateful to hear that Paul is on track to make a full recovery. And President Biden. But you can't condemn the violence unless you condemn those people who continue to argue the election was not real, that it's being stolen, that all the, all the malarkey that's being put out there to undermine democracy. Tonight, authorities investigating social media posts they increasingly believe the suspect made, including wide-ranging, unfounded conspiracy theories, including the false claim that Biden lost the 2020 election. Within hours on social media amid the news of the attack, authorities warning they were already seeing posts applauding the attack. And Elon Musk, the new owner of the social media giant Twitter, sending out a tweet that included a conspiracy theory about the attack on Paul Pelosi. The tweet taken down hours later without an apology or explanation, though critics say the damage was already done, having sent it out to his 112 million followers. We should be able to all engage in passionate political discourse, but still remain respectful of one another. Violence certainly has no place in San Francisco or in politics. Moa Lange joins us now from San Francisco. Moa authorities there just wrapped up a news conference earlier. What's the latest on Paul Pelosi's condition tonight? Well, Lindsay, yeah, as you mentioned, the district attorney here in San Francisco just wrapped up a press conference where she announced those additional state charges against DePat. Meanwhile, Paul Pelosi remains in the ICU, recovering from multiple surgeries he had over the course of the weekend. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi says his condition continues to improve enough so that he has been able to speak to investigators and provide at least some details about the attack and the break-in. Positive update there. Mola Lange, our thanks to you. This all comes as federal authorities warn with just eight days until the midterms, there has been a stunning spike in threats to lawmakers across the political spectrum against both Democrats as well as Republicans. As I get right to our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Pierre, all of this has to be concerning for officials now with just a little over a week left until the midterms. Indeed, Lindsay, these federal charges in the Pelosi attack lay out precisely what law enforcement has been warning about for months. A senior law enforcement official just told me that even though the suspect may have had mental health issues, there's no doubt that this assault and attempted kidnapping of the speaker was politically motivated. It comes as FBI and Homeland Security officials have put out a new bulletin warning that radicals fueled by ongoing divisiveness and obsessed with lies about election fraud could target the midterms. The evidence is mounting that we're in a dangerous time. Threats against members of Congress more than doubling since 2017 to nearly 10,000. And the number of threats investigated against federal judges more than tripling. You can see why police are on alert only eight days before the midterms, Lindsay. Yeah, clearly we can in such turbulent times. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Staying in Washington, where affirmative action was before the Supreme Court today with two cases challenging the use of race and admissions at Harvard and the University of North Carolina. So will the court's conservative supermajority overturn decades of ruling on the issue? ABC's senior national correspondent Terry Moran was at the court today and has the very latest. In the Supreme Court today, clear signs that the long era of affirmative action in higher education in America could be coming to an end. The court's conservative justices cast doubts on using race as a factor in college admissions in order to achieve the educational benefits of diversity on campus, with Justice Clarence Thomas scorning the very idea of such a thing. 
I've heard the word uh, diversity quite a few times, and I don't have a clue what it means. Uh, it seems to mean everything for everyone. Justice Amy Coney Barrett saying the court itself has always envisioned a timeline for affirmative action. How do you know when you're done? When would you have the end point? Two cases were before the court, both brought by the conservative group Students for Fair Admissions. One against Harvard College, alleging that Harvard discriminates against Asian American applicants by using subjective standards to score their personalities. The other case against the University of North Carolina, alleging it discriminated against white and Asian American students by giving preference to black, Hispanic, and Native American ones. Both institutions deny the allegations. Chief Justice John Roberts, a longtime critic of race-conscious policies, suggested that there are other ways to achieve diversity beyond the mere fact of race. Maybe there will be an incentive for the university to, in fact, truly pursue race-neutral alternatives. But liberal justices on the court warned that losing race as part of the application could disadvantage students of color. I'm worried that that creates an inequity in the system. Justice Jackson really strong in her opposition of what the conservative majority seems to be sounding here. Terry Moran joins us now from outside the Supreme Court. Terry, is it fair to say the conservative justices seem to signal pretty clearly where their opinion is likely heading? No question about it. From Chief Justice John Roberts, who said years ago, expressing his opposition to affirmative action, that uh, the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, targeting affirmative action right through that, that bench today on the conservative side. A lot of skepticism. That really, the question was, how far would they go? Would they sharply limit it? Or would they go all the way and ban it? And if they do in higher education, the same reasoning could be used to end affirmative action in hiring and all aspects of American business, contracting as well, grants and fellowships, and on and on. It's just a huge case, Lindsay. It's such a slippery slope with uh, wide-ranging implications, as you point out there, Terry. When are we expecting the justices to hand down their decision? Well, a case this big is likely to take the whole term. They'll be trading opinions back and forth, and so we will expect a ruling to be announced probably uh, next June. Lindsay. All right. Terry Moran for us. Thanks so much, as always, Terry. And for more on this, let's bring in ABC's Devin Dwyer, who covers the courts for us. So, Devin, the liberal justices expressed their concerns about ending racial preferences in admissions. Did they make any arguments at all that, that landed and, and could sway the details of the final decision? Well, Lindsay, the liberal justices and actually some of the attorneys for the schools today conceded the point that race in college admissions was never meant to be used forever. Uh, it was an interesting point. Of course, that's part of the Supreme Court's precedent. And Justice Elena Kagan today really emphasized it, drove it home. Almost, it seemed, to show a point of common ground. Uh, the bottom line of their arguments was really it's not time to end affirmative action just yet. They said there's a compelling government interest in diverse campuses and learning environments. But I got to tell you, the conservatives, as Terry said, they're, they're not buying it. And they kept asking over and over again, how diverse is diverse enough? How will we know? And they didn't get a clear answer on either of those questions, Lindsay. Yeah, they seem pretty dug in already. But you've been talking to students and colleges about this case. How are they reacting to this looming decision? Well, the views on a college campus, as you can imagine, are as diverse as the country itself, really. The schools insist, and we heard from them today, Lindsay, that there are no really viable race-neutral alternatives that would help them build a campus uh, as diverse as it needs to be right now. They insist it's a tool that's necessary, not one they want to use forever, but they need to use it narrowly. The students, for their part, certainly at Harvard and UNC, are concerned uh, about this case. They know the stakes. A lot of them told me they have benefited from affirmative action. Uh, white students have told me they benefit from the diverse learning environment that it's created on campus. Others, of course, take a different view, say they believe that these admissions processes should be based solely on merit. So it's a passionate debate. We'll see where these justices come out. But the bottom line, and if the study uh, and recent experiences that I've looked at at schools in California and elsewhere that have discontinued these policy is any indication, Lindsay, if the Supreme Court strikes this down, it will mean fewer students of color uh, at the nation's most selective and elite universities. How would it change the admissions process if affirmative action is overturned by the court? Is it just a matter of you don't check a box as far as your, your race? 
It's funny you should say that because Chief Justice John Roberts today actually floated that idea. Maybe we just get rid of the checkbox and let students raise the idea of race and race-based experiences in essays and other forms of the application process. He didn't get a lot of takers there either. Some other of his fellow conservatives sort of shot that down. But there is going to have to be a scramble uh, for how schools can approach this without explicitly looking at race. And I do expect, Lindsay, based on my conversations with a number of university presidents, that they will continue to find ways to both proactively reach out to minority students they need on campus, look at other factors, socioeconomic background uh, among them, uh, and listening to those essays. The students um, can write whatever they want when they apply to college, and that may have an impact on those admissions counselors as well. All right. We appreciate the academic discussion there. Devin Dwyer in Washington for us. Thanks so much, Devin. Thanks, Lindsay. Horror in South Korea, where more than 155 people were killed in a crowd crush. ABC News has learned that two American college students are among the dead. 100,000, mostly young people, came together in the streets of Seoul Saturday night for a Halloween celebration. Many funneled into a narrow alleyway. Now there's outrage. The police reported only 137 officers were on duty to manage that massive gathering. ABC's Matt Gutman is in Seoul for us tonight. Tonight, forensics teams investigating how a Halloween street celebration became one of the deadliest crowd crushes in decades. Dozens of medics desperately trying to press life into lifeless bodies, rows of blue body bags. Saturday night, around 100,000 revelers packed Seoul's hip Itaewon neighborhood, pouring out of the subways and into the streets. Thousands funneled into this alleyway, which by 10 p.m. became a deadly bottleneck. Many caught in the stampede, international students. Alice and Anne Lou seen here trapped in the crowd, that laughter quickly turning to terror. Anne Lou, you passed out at some point. Because I didn't have air. And did they just lift you up above yeah. the crowd? Yeah. And as the crowd pressed, the life was squeezed out of at least 155 victims. It took over 30 minutes for first responders to wade into that sea of bodies. Korean police tonight acknowledging they had only 137 officers on duty for that crowd of 100,000. Among the dead, 20-year-old Ann Giesk, a junior from the University of Kentucky, and the niece of Ohio Congressman Brad Wenstrup. And 20-year-old Stephen Blessy, who was on a semester abroad from Georgia's Kennesaw State University. Blessy's father said that when he called his son, a policeman who had found his phone answered. I can't tell you the pain that is. I wish I would have not let him go. I'm sure that sentiment is shared by so many parents. Matt Gutman joins us now from Seoul. Matt, what are you learning about the victims tonight? This is such a cosmopolitan part of Seoul, Lindsay. Uh, Itaiwan, it is filled with uh, kebab shops, coffee shops. There are lots of Americans here. And the victims were from 14 countries. The vast majority of them, over 100, were still in their 20s, one of them in middle school. Now, we've been watching this memorial here grow by the hour. You can see the white carnations behind me. You can hear the chants of those monks holding vigil here. And of course, post-it notes written to the victims. Korea has declared a week of national mourning here, Lindsay. Mm. All right, Matt Gutman, our thanks to you so much. Five years after the fact, there is a major break in a double homicide in Delphi, Indiana, which made national headlines. A man is now under arrest for the murder of two teenage girls found dead near a hiking trail. As police reveal new details, they say the investigation is far from over. ABC's Alex Perez has the latest. Nearly six years after the mysterious murder of two teen girls devastated Delphi, Indiana and made national headlines, police today finally naming their suspect, 50-year-old Richard Allen, a married father and pharmacy technician who worked at the local CVS. He's been charged with two counts of murder for the murder of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Allen lived less than two miles from the trail where 13-year-old Abby Williams and 14-year-old Libby German vanished in February 2017. A day later, police finding their bodies and Libby's phone with critical video she recorded of the suspect and this chilling audio of his voice. <laughs> Police releasing two sketches of the suspect, always warning he could be a member of the community. A photo at a local bar where Allen was a regular shows him standing with one of those suspect sketches behind him. 
Libby's family telling us her aunt knew Alan from the CBS and that he didn't charge her when she came in to print photos for Libby's funeral. The family heartbroken. It's hard. How can somebody do that and then just go on living life like nothing happened? I, I don't understand. Probably never will understand that. So hard for anyone to comprehend. Alex Perez joins us now from Delphi, Indiana. Alex, do police believe that Alan acted alone or are they searching for anyone else? Well, Lindsay, authorities are very tight-lipped about this investigation, but they did say the investigation is not over just yet and added if others are involved, they will be held accountable. That suspect has pleaded not guilty and he's being held without bond. Lindsay? All right, Alex Perez, our thanks to you. Now to the war in Ukraine and a new wave of missile attacks. Russia has targeted civilian infrastructure across the country. In Kyiv, people have spent the day without power or water. Emergency workers are racing to try to restore them. Our James Longman has the details from Ukraine. Tonight, Russia launching more than 50 missiles targeting critical infrastructure in Ukraine. This one flying just over these apartment buildings near Kyiv before making impact. The Ukrainian military claimed they shot down 45 of Russia's missiles. But power and water supplies were still hit across the country. Our Tom Sufi Burridge in the capital. The missile strikes have knocked out running water in most of Kyiv. You can see the queue for water here goes right down the road. Putin lashing out from the air because his forces are struggling on the battlefield. His grip on the southern city of Kherson now in the balance. With a Ukrainian counterattack likely. And Lindsay, in another development tonight, a record amount of grain has left the port here in Odessa. Even though Russia has pulled out of an agreement to allow these shipments to continue, they are badly needed to stave off a global hunger crisis. But tonight, Moscow has ominously called the resumption of these shipments risky. Lindsay? James, thank you. The war in Ukraine continues to have an impact on global commodity markets like grain and oil. U.S. officials had hoped the gas prices could remain contained, but a recent decision by OPEC Plus, which is led by Saudi Arabia, to cut oil production sparked outrage and some to question the U.S. alliance with the oil-rich nation. These questions come as we're learning new details about a Saudi-American man stuck in prison overseas. Saad Ibrahim al-Mahdi is an American citizen who posted tweets criticizing the Saudi government's class system and distribution of money among its people. The 72-year-old sent those tweets over the course of a few years while he was here in America. When he went to visit his family in Saudi Arabia in November of 2021, he was taken from the airport and has been in Saudi prison ever since. Joining us now is his son, Ibrahim al Maldi, who has been fighting to secure his father's release. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Talk to me about that day that you last saw your dad. How did you hear about what happened? Last time I saw my dad, I thought everything was okay. Uh, I didn't know about his situation until December 20th. That's when I reached out to State Department and our embassy in Riyadh. And what did you hear? They told me, we'll try to locate your father. We have no uh, idea where he is right now. And did you ever learn then about some charges? How did that information come to you? Nothing until March uh, 29th when uh, they saw my father in Al Hayr prison. It's a political prison where they throw the Saudis there for uh, practicing freedom of speech, which they don't have in their constitution there, but as American citizens, we have it here. And so what are they accusing him of? Uh, terrorism, uh, trying to destabilize the kingdom. And they torture him until he convicted himself that he made these tweets to do that. And you say that he's been tortured. What evidence do you have of that? That's his own words, his own reply to the judge. The judge wanted to sentence him for 42 years. But after reading my father's reply to uh, the way the investigation went, they discounted him to 16 years from 42. You've not been able to talk to your father? Until this now. And the Department of State have no news about my father since August 10th. So you don't really know his status at all? I think. Is there any way to get any kind of update or what is the United States? Uh... I mean, the White House need to recognize my father. He's a senior American citizen. I don't want my father to die in prison like Dr. Abdullah Hamid.
of course, you're aware of the publicity and the push to get the United States to free Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner from, from Russia. Do you feel that there is any similar efforts underway to, to get your dad out? That's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm hoping for, um, but nothing yet. You've said that the State Department has mishandled your father's case, and I, I do want to, to give you a quote that they have told ABC. They say, we have consistently and intensively raised our concerns regarding his case at senior levels of the Saudi government several times in both Washington and Riyadh, and will continue to do so. The Saudi government understands the priority we attach to resolving this matter and that they have no further updates. How do you respond to that? I mean... If His Highness Crown Prince, quite sensitive from Twitter, I suggest he buy the rest of the steak and shut down Twitter. He can't send senior American citizen to prison for practicing his First Amendment. And, and so what does the U.S. State Department tell you? Or do you get any updates from them at all? Nothing. Last time I talked to them was two weeks ago. And there what is did nothing. they say? We're still working on it. We submit a ticket to see your father, but the Saudis didn't respond to the ticket. If you could talk to your dad, what would you say to him? Said, I love you so much. I'll do everything to bring you back home. Is there anything else that you can do? Uh, do you feel, uh, are you uh, kind of um, at, in the, the hands at this point? Uh, are your hands tied because you're just waiting for the State Department to act? Absolutely. They need to act and they must act. My father is facing the most aggressive sentence for American citizen overseas. The Saudi court under MBS, they broke a new record. They need to act. Did your dad express any concern when he was going over there to Saudi that because he had been critical of the government that something might happen? That's a lovely question. My father have his American passport printed, a photo of it, in his bedroom. And he told me, son, if I'm gone, immediately reach out to our embassy. And you did that? Absolutely. And you feel that the response has not been adequate? Not yet. Well, we thank you so much for, for sharing your story, your father's story with us, and, and hope that it'll do some good for you. Thank you, Lindsay. When we come back, a football brawl after a college game and the criminal investigation that's now underway. From insecure to Instagram, Amanda Seals is using humor to shine a light on some serious issues. She tells us about her next big act, why she's using a game show to celebrate black culture. But up next, we've all seen movements to take a more natural approach to life, but what about death? From being buried directly into the soil to bodies being composted on this Halloween, Ginger Z explores why so many people are choosing using green burials. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. 
my favorite show. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. Here's to everything ahead. In L.A., authorities are investigating a dangerous carbon dioxide leak at LAX. It happened in the terminal baggage area, and it resulted in four workers becoming sick, one with grave conditions. The leak is believed to have come from a nearby utility room. No travelers were affected. On this Halloween, we are delving into something that many don't often go into great details about death. But, of course, it happens to us all, ready or not. And chances are our last act will be leaving a carbon footprint. But there is a new greener option that some say it's important to know about, particularly if you are all in on the fight against climate change. Here's ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z. We've all come from the Earth, so we should go back to the Earth as we have since the dawn of time. And I think we've lost touch with that, and now we're coming back to it. Beneath the vibrant green moss and gorgeous autumn leaves, in the soil of this winding nature trail, lie loved ones laid to rest in the original, natural way. It feels different than a typical cemetery. It, it feels lighter. It's not as heavy. Yes. Uh, and you know, the recreational aspect of it, to see people out here just enjoying the property feels good. Remembrance markings etched in real stones, not fabricated unnatural concrete, dot the winding trails. Here, death is breathing new life beneath our feet. If the stone was not there, you would never know there was a burial there. Nature is incredibly healing. Yeah. Ed Bixby is the president of the Green Burial Council and owner of Steelman Town Cemetery and Nature Preserve. He views death not as a somber moment, but a celebration of life and a way to return back to Mother Nature naturally. A natural burial means no embalming, no outer burial container like a concrete vault, a biodegradable burial container itself, and no upright monument set in concrete. But the biggest part of what we do is the family participation, so the family can be part of the entire process from start to finish. For 15 years, he's been reclaiming and restoring natural burial traditions, proving that going green doesn't have to end when our time here does. Is it as simple, then, as just going back to the earth? It's as simple as picking up a shovel and opening a gravesite, nothing more. A traditional burial produces 250 pounds of carbon, whereas a green burial sequesters 25 pounds of carbon. Prior to the Civil War, many cemeteries were created as garden cemeteries. So some of the largest cemeteries in America that are the most picturesque, giant, beautiful cemeteries were to be used by the family on a daily basis to picnic and congregate. We got away from that. According to the National Funeral Directors Association, cremation is the most widely used process. Of the more than 3 million people who died in the U.S. in 2021, more than half were cremated. For most of my life, I know I thought cremation was for me because it would take up less space and just made sense. But that has a pretty big carbon footprint, too. It can be like taking a 500-mile trip in a vehicle. So doing something like this, where stones or a tree mark your burial site and you go straight into the ground, is likely the best for the planet. 
Across the nation in Seattle, Washington, Katrina Spade has developed an option for those who might not have access to open green burial fields. I was approaching my 30th birthday and I started to feel mortal <laughs> and I started to look into the options for my body after I died and I found out of a practice that farmers use and I thought if you can compost a cow you can probably compost a human being. Surrounded by alfalfa, wood chips and straw, the body is placed inside the vessel where it will decompose for more than a month. By the end of the process, each body will create one cubic yard of nutrient-rich soil, filling an entire pickup truck bed. I like to think about composting as what is happening on the forest floor all over the world, where you have dead leaves and sticks and your errant chipmunk all decomposing to create topsoil. In a lot of ways, human composting is taking that same process and putting it inside of a vessel and refining it and making sure it's happening in a really rigorous, closely monitored way. I love the idea that after I die, I don't necessarily have to go to a natural burial ground somewhere out in the countryside somewhere, but rather I can return to the city as soil and actually be part of the urban fabric that way. Human composting is only currently legal in five states, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Vermont, and most recently, California. The difficulty in, in making human composting available to everyone everywhere is that you have to approach each state and then uh, you know, approach their laws separately. She's also created a pre-death program called Pre-Compose. We have over a thousand members who've prepaid for their funerals with us, their future funerals with us. And about 25% of those are under the age of 49. And so you think of all these young people, 20, 30, 40, signing up for their funeral service. It speaks to the real desire to have meaningful options and environmental options when you die. Cemeteries all over the world are reaching capacity. Turns out it doesn't really make good business sense to sell someone a piece of land for eternity. <laughs> When I first heard Katrina talk about her ideas, it resonated on so many levels. Uh, we would just need the Nina Schoen is a pre-composed member. She makes monthly payments to prepay her funeral at Recompose. What's important to me is this process of transforming into soil, transforming into something that can nourish new life, that that is meaningful. That is the pinnacle of what I want. And what happens after that, to me, is for my loved ones. If they want a keepsake amount of soil, if they want to plant a tree, if they want to donate the soil to a part of nature that needs nourishment, that's all fine with me. My, my goal has already been accomplished. While our death does mean the end for our body, it can be a beautiful transformation of new life for Earth. I had a young lady come down from New York City, and uh, when it came time to lay her mother to rest, she took off her high heels and she grabbed that shovel and she filled that grave in by herself. She needed to do it for herself. Mm -hmm. And she collapsed when it was done and it changed her forever. In death, there is new life. Our thanks to Ginger for that. Still ahead here on Prime. Prosecutors say it's a case about greed and cheating. The allegations today from the criminal trial against the Trump Organization. It's called a planet killer. How close a dangerous asteroid could come to Earth? Another history-making moment for Taylor Swift. We take a look at some of the major records she broke by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. The White House reminds us how the first family has tackled Halloween over the years. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. Lover or hater, Taylor Swift knows how to get the attention of music fans with her album releases, and her latest is setting records worldwide. Let's take a look by the numbers. The Mastermind has her 11th number one album debut with Midnight's hitting the top of the charts in its first week and already becoming the biggest debut of her career. Midnight's debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and hit number one on charts in 14 countries, helping lift Swift to the status of best-selling artist of the year. Swift is also now the only artist to have five albums debut with more than a million units sold in their first week, a feat that is not just a sweet nothing. Midnight's is the biggest album debut in seven years since Adele's 25 topped the charts in 2015. And Swift is now tied with legend Barbara Streisand for the most number one albums among female artists. She also has bejeweled the streaming charts with Midnight's passing one billion global streams in a week and with 228 million and single day stream Swift broke Spotify's record for most streams of one artist in a single day. She's also now the most streamed female artist ever on Spotify, with more than 35 billion streams for her entire body of work. The initial release of Midnight's on October 21st featured 13 tracks, likely a nod to Swift's lucky number, and a deluxe version of the album released three hours later, dubbed the 3 a.m. edition, came with seven bonus tracks, giving Swifties plenty of songs to pour over for months to come. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The fallout in Brazil as the country's fall right president is voted out the concerns about whether or not he'll contest the results the major settlement for two men wrongfully convicted of murdering a famed civil rights leader the first to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com with so much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes 
found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A decades-long precedent in education could be overturned as the Supreme Court is once again being asked to consider whether race should play a role in college and university admissions. The high court has previously ruled race can be used as a factor, among others, as campuses seek more diverse student bodies. But that could change this session with the court 6-3 conservative majority and Americans changing attitudes. Edward Blom of Students for a Fair Admissions is behind the Supreme Court challenges to affirmative action at Harvard University and the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, arguing those policies disadvantage white and Asian American students and violate civil and constitutional rights. Opening arguments underway in the criminal trial of the Trump Organization. This case is about greed and cheating, prosecutors said as they began the trial of former President Trump's family business. Prosecutors said the Trump Organization helped certain executives skirt taxes by paying their rent or making their car payments off the books. The company has pleaded not guilty. While Trump himself is not charged and is not expected to testify, his name came up during opening statements because a prosecutor said Trump signed the checks that paid the school tuition for one executive's grandchildren. The former Grand Rapids police officer charged in the deadly shooting of Patrick Leoya will stand trial. Christopher Schur was fired from the department in June and has pled not guilty to second-degree murder. The judge said a jury should be able to determine if Schur really felt that he was in imminent danger and if deadly force was necessary. Leoya was shot and killed in April after being pulled over for a faulty license plate with video showing a chase and struggle between the two men that led to Leoya being shot in the head while on the ground. Police said Leoya had grabbed at the officer's stun gun, sure faces up to life in prison if convicted. A settlement has been reached on behalf of two men wrongfully convicted of killing civil rights leader Malcolm X. New York City will pay $26 million and the state of New York will pay an additional $10 million to Muhammad Aziz and the estate of Khalil Islam, who died years ago. The pair were arrested in 1965 for the killing and spent decades behind bars before they were paroled in the 80s and finally exonerated last year. The Manhattan district attorney at the time apologized for what he called serious, unacceptable violations of the law and the public trust. Fallout continues from the major brawl that broke out following the Michigan-Michigan State football game. Shortly after Michigan's 29-7 win Saturday, a crowd of Michigan State players were seen surrounding and attacking two Michigan players as they were walking up the tunnel to their respective locker rooms. Newly released video appears to show a Michigan State player using his helmet to attack a Michigan player. Michigan State suspended four of the players involved, while the Big Ten Conference and police are investigating. Michigan coach Jim Harbaugh told reporters today he expects serious consequences. I can't imagine that this will not result in criminal charges. The videos are, uh, are, uh, are bad, and um, it's clear what, what transpired. It seems uh, very, very open and shut. A team of international researchers say in a statement they've discovered three new near-Earth asteroids that have been hiding within the inner solar system between the Earth and the Sun, a particularly difficult area to observe given the Sun's glare. The team says two of the asteroids have orbits that won't intersect Earth, but one, a 1.5-kilometer-wide asteroid, could someday cross our path. The threat of asteroids hitting Earth is a real concern and something NASA's working to mitigate. The agency said a test of its DART probe last month that was meant to alter the course of an asteroid was successful. 
We've all been focused on the U.S. midterms, but to our South, one of the world's most consequential elections of the year just took place, and it could have ramifications for us all. By slim margin, voters in Brazil ousted far-right strongman Bolsonaro and brought back into power the country's left-wing former president known as Lula. But as Matt Rivers reports from Sao Paulo, there is still a lot of unease inside that country, primarily about how Bolsonaro's supporters will respond to the results of the most divisive vote in that country's history. Tonight, a stunning defeat for Brazil's conservative leader, Jair Bolsonaro, widely called the Trump of the tropics. Leftist former president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva edging out the incumbent after just one term, now faced with uniting this heavily divided country and an economy saddled with rising debt. Tonight, Bolsonaro's supporters igniting this fiery blockade many questioning the election's legitimacy. Fraud, 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 fraud. Election officials insist the vote should be trusted. So far, Bolsonaro not conceding or commenting on the results. The Silva supporters encouraged by his pledge to end the deforestation of the Amazon, which surged under his predecessor. The Amazon rainforest, one of the biggest climate concerns of the world. I think this is something really important. I think this can be a huge problem for us in the future. But he is facing distrust among some voters after being imprisoned in 2018 for corruption. Those convictions were later overturned. Lindsey De Silva won't take office until January 1st, but we learned today that President Biden spoke to him to offer his congratulations. Meanwhile, one Bolsonaro supporter told me it's not truly over until 2023. Lindsay. All right, Matt, we'll see how all this plays out. Thanks so much. When it comes to discussing politics, race, and black culture, comedian and activist Amanda Seals certainly is not shy about sharing her opinions. In addition to educating and entertaining her millions of social media followers, Seals also starred in HBO's Insecure and is now returning to stand up. I sat down with her to discuss her black outside again comedy tour, her newest job, and how she was using a game show to celebrate black culture. Time for an evening with Miss Amanda Seals, which I'm excited about. <laughs> so you have talked about being unapologetic and that that is a superpower for you. What gives you the confidence to go there and just say it? And so a lot of times when we are talking about things that people like to say are generalizations, what we're actually addressing is the fact that certain groups are, away, are able to get away with certain things. I think the facts. You know, confidence for me, and I talk about this in my book, Small Doses, is based on facts. Whenever you find yourself wavering or having self-doubt, like, you can go back to experience that you have had that lets you know, like, well, I've done this and I've done that, or I've researched this and I've read that. So, like, that's where your confidence should be based in, is the fact-based uh, experience. And so I feel like when I'm talking, I'm not just talking out my neck, you know? I'm, I'm talking out my facts. How is it that you deal with some of the heaviest topics, especially in black culture, with comedy? It's like, it's a joke, but it's really not. I mean, I think that's a skill that is really inherent to black folks. I feel like black folks as a culture, that is part of our existence, is finding ways to bring in humor to talk about our own pain, our own difficulties, our own struggles. And I feel like it's just in my DNA to do that. I think it's also necessary to do that because a lot of these topics are things folks may want to shy away from or not deal with. But when you bring some comedy into it, it relaxes that outward exterior a bit and says, okay, well, I'll consider it. Who are your followers? You have like two million followers on Instagram. I don't even know. For the most part, are you preaching to the choir? Are people already mm. saying, amen, I get it, I feel that way, or are people hating you, like, you don't even know what you're talking about? I mean, there's always gonna be a smattering of the you don't even know what you're talking about, but I do know what I'm talking about. So, like, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of my followers are folks who genuinely want to see positive change, people who have value systems rooted in just folks having equality and access and freedom, and folks who want to see honesty as like a bottom line in not only their lives, but in society. Tell me about the Black Outside Again tour. First of all, the title first is, is, like, <laughs> is funny. That's the idea, because it's a comedy tour. <laughs> The Black Outside Again tour is me coming back outside, but I'm black outside because I was in that house for these two years, okay? Like, people were still doing stand-up, honey, I was sitting down. 
Uh, I was not about to get this COVID on stage, no ma'am. But then I just started really seeing headline after headline after headline of madness. And I was like, I got stuff to talk about. The Black Outside Again tour is me doing stand-up. I'm also doing Smart, Funny, and Black, which is my variety comedy game show. And uh, we've just been going all over the nation, bringing joy back to people. And I really have had a great time. Tell us about the game show. Smart, Funny, and Black is a game show I created because I got tired of there being so many negative images of black folks on a daily basis. And I was like, we don't have anywhere to celebrate the positive. Like, I need to create a safe space. So so though Smart, Funny, and Black is welcome to all, it is for black folks. And it is a comedy game show where I bring two black spurts on stage and I test their knowledge of black culture, black history, and the black experience in games that I've created. We have a live band, so we do sing-alongs throughout the show. Uh, the games are basically improv-based. I write them based on our guests, so it's tailored to that. We've had Keenan and Kale on stage. We've had Gabrae Sidibe. We have had Ananda versus Free. Like, we've created these black pop culture moments on our stage that honestly I feel like don't get enough love, okay? <laughs> we have audience interaction throughout the show. I say that it is a cross between an HBCU homecoming, <laughs> a family reunion, and a revival, all in one. How is an interactive show different from stand-up comedy? Well, you know, stand-up comedy is interactive. Ultimately, if people ain't laughing, maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a lonely time, okay? <laughs> Smart, Funny, and Black is interactive in its own way because we stand up and do the electric slide in the middle of the show. You know, we are singing Happy Birthday, the Stevie Wonder version, <laughs> in the middle of the show. We're singing Lift Every Voice and Sing, and everybody got to stand up and do the yeah, double clap. Yes, yes. You know, so that's stuff that's not happening at my stand up. Jobby job, hey, jobby job. Your girl got a job, your girl got a job. Tell me about uh, Reach Media. You mm -hmm. now have a jobby job. I have a jobby uh, job. Tell me about the new radio show. I'm just overjoyed about launching this radio show with Reach Media, The Amanda Seal Show. Very original name. Very original name. Um, I really feel like it's the first time I'm getting the chance to have my own platform backed by a bigger machine where I'm actually getting to say what I want to say and creatively do what I want to do. I have a co-host, DJ Nails. Uh, so we are going to be coming at you starting in Philadelphia, but you will be able to listen to the podcast on wherever podcasts are. So we're going to... We're gonna be doing something different. So what is the trajectory next for Amanda Seals? What would you like, your lips to God's ears, what comes next? I've always said that what I want is options. For me, it's not about just one thing. It's about being able to let my multi-hyphenate flag wave in as many spaces as possible. So for me, what's next is just a greater access at being able to be creative without having to do so much convincing in order to get access to the space. Our thanks to Amanda Seals for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, season's creepings, as the National Zoo tweeted as they posted this photo of a panda and other animals playing with a pumpkin. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Hour, staying on top of a few things, including the sharp rise in hate speech on Twitter since Elon Musk officially became owner. And the concerns over spiked drinks in one American city continues. More on that when we come back. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
from the giant sequoias to the waterfalls. It's an amazing place. But in Yosemite, criminals go on vacation too. The park ranger found partial human remains. It was a human hand. That opened the possibility of suspects. Henry Lee Lucas. Carrie Stainer. Donald Gibson. Any of them could have done it. We're going to figure this thing out. Wild Crime, season two, Murder in Yosemite. Now streaming only on Hulu. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several development stories here at ABC News this hour. Tonight, we're tracking a new powerful West Coast storm with alerts from California to Washington. Heavy rain is expected from Portland to Seattle, up to half a foot in some places and two inches of snow in the mountains. That system will head east later on this week. A new study has found hate speech at Twitter has sharply risen since Elon Musk took over the company last week. The seven-day average of tweets using studied hate terms was never higher than 84 times in an hour. But get this, on October 28th, the number skyrocketed to nearly 5,000 times over a span of just 12 hours. Musk has promised to reduce restrictions on the platform, and that has raised concerns of it becoming filled with more hate speech and offensive terms. Someone could have a very happy Halloween. The Powerball jackpot is now $1 billion after no one won Saturday's drawing. It's only the second time in Powerball's 30-year history that the jack jackpot has gone that high. Chances of winning are 1 in 292 million. Next to new details in the politically motivated attack on Paul Pelosi, the husband of Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, whom she calls Pop. A federal complaint unsealed today indicates 42-year-old David DePap wanted to take Nancy Pelosi hostage and interrogate her, and if she lied, he wanted to break her kneecaps as a lesson to Democrats. Tonight, he is facing federal charges of attempted kidnapping of a U.S. official and a slew of other charges, including the attempted murder of Paul Pelosi. Mulalaney reports in from San Francisco. Tonight, federal authorities detailing a shocking, politically motivated hammer attack on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband that fractured his skull. According to the affidavit, 42-year-old David DePap telling police that he was going to hold Nancy hostage and talk to her. And if she lied, he was going to break her kneecaps. DePap allegedly describing the speaker as the, quote, leader of the pack of what he said were lies told by the Democratic Party. DePap also later explained that by breaking Nancy's kneecaps, she would then have to be wheeled into Congress, which would show other members of Congress there were consequences to actions. DePap now facing federal charges of assault on an immediate family member of a federal official and attempted kidnapping of a federal official. And late today in San Francisco, authorities here announcing additional charges. The charges that we are filing today include attempted murder, residential burglary, assault with a deadly weapon, elder abuse, false imprisonment of an elder, as well as threats to a public official and their family. The federal affidavit claiming DePap told police that he broke into the house through a glass door early Friday. DePap stated that Pelosi was in bed and appeared surprised, adding he told Pelosi to wake up and that he was looking for Nancy. Moments later, at 2.23 a.m., according to the affidavit, Pelosi was able to go into the bathroom, which is when he was able to call 911. We asked the district attorney about that call. How, how significant was it that Mr. Pelosi was able to get away for that moment and call 911? Um, I truly believe, based on what I know, that it was life-saving. According to the affidavit, DePap had zip ties, tape, rope, and at least one hammer with him that morning. The evidence further shows that DePap assaulted Mr. Pelosi with DePap's own hammer. When the police uh, responded that the front door was opened, um, both men were holding on to one end of the hammer. There was an order to drop the web, drop the hammer once the police realized what they were holding. Um, the suspect then pulled it away and that's when he attacked him with it. And DePap's question to Paul Pelosi, according to sources, where's Nancy? Eerily similar to the chants made by the mob that attacked the Capitol on January 6th. Nancy! Oh, Nancy! 
political leaders on both sides of the aisle condemning the attack. Former Vice President Mike Pence, who was in the Capitol on January 6th, along with Speaker Pelosi, tweeting, this is an outrage, and there can be no tolerance for violence against public officials or their families. This man should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell tweeting he's horrified and disgusted, adding he's grateful to hear that Paul is on track to make a full recovery. And President Biden. But you can't condemn the violence unless you condemn those people who continue to argue the election was not real, that it's being stolen, that all the, all the malarkey that's being put out there to undermine democracy. Tonight, authorities investigating social media posts they increasingly believe the suspect made, including wide-ranging, unfounded conspiracy theories, including the false claim that Biden lost the 2020 election. Within hours on social media amid the news of the attack, authorities warning they were already seeing posts applauding the attack. And Elon Musk, the new owner of the social media giant Twitter, sending out a tweet that included a conspiracy theory about the attack on Paul Pelosi. The tweet taken down hours later without an apology or explanation, though critics say the damage was already done, having sent it out to his 112 million followers. We should be able to all engage in passionate political discourse, but still remain respectful of one another. Violence certainly has no place in San Francisco or in politics. Our thanks to Mola Lange. Affirmative action was before the Supreme Court today with two cases challenging the use of race in admissions at Harvard and the University of North Carolina. So will the court's conservative supermajority overturn decades of ruling on the issue? ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran was at the court today and has the latest. In the Supreme Court today, clear signs that the long era of affirmative action in higher education in America could be coming to an end. The court's conservative justices cast doubts on using race as a factor in college admissions in order to achieve the educational benefits of diversity on campus, with Justice Clarence Thomas scorning the very idea of such a thing. I've heard the word uh, diversity quite a few times, and I don't have a clue what it means. Uh, it seems to mean everything for everyone. Justice Amy Coney Barrett saying the court itself has always envisioned a timeline for affirmative action. How do you know when you're done? When would you have the end point? Two cases were before the court, both brought by the conservative group Students for Fair Admissions. One against Harvard College, alleging that Harvard discriminates against Asian American applicants by using subjective standards to score their personalities. The other case against the University of North Carolina, alleging it discriminated against white and Asian American students by giving preference to black, Hispanic, and Native American ones. Both institutions deny the allegations. Chief Justice John Roberts, a longtime critic of race-conscious policies, suggested that there are other ways to achieve diversity beyond the mere fact of race. Maybe there will be an incentive for the university to, in fact, truly pursue race-neutral alternatives. But liberal justices on the court warned that losing race as part of the application could disadvantage students of color. I'm worried that that creates an inequity in the system. Our thanks to Terry Moran for that. Horror in South Korea, where more than 155 people were killed in a crowd crush. ABC News has learned that two American college students are among the dead. 100,000 mostly young people came together in the streets of Seoul Saturday night for a Halloween celebration. Many funneled into a narrow alleyway. Now there is outrage. The police reported only 137 officers were on duty to manage that massive gathering. ABC's Mac Upman is in Seoul for us tonight. Tonight, forensics teams investigating how a Halloween street celebration became one of the deadliest crowd crushes in decades. Dozens of medics desperately trying to press life into lifeless bodies, rows of blue body bags. Saturday night, around 100,000 revelers packing Seoul's hip Itaewon neighborhood, pouring out of the subways and into the streets. Thousands funneled into this alleyway, which by 10 p.m. became a deadly bottleneck. Many caught in the stampede, international students. <laughs> Alice and Anne Lou seen here trapped in the crowd, that laughter quickly turning to terror. Anne Lou, you passed out at some point. Because I didn't have air. And did they just lift you up above yeah. the crowd? Yeah. And as the crowd pressed, the life was squeezed out of at least 155 victims. 
It took over 30 minutes for first responders to wade into that sea of bodies. Korean police tonight acknowledging they had only 137 officers on duty for that crowd of 100,000. And among the dead, 20-year-old Ann Gieske, a junior from the University of Kentucky, and the niece of Ohio Congressman Brad Wenstrup. And 20-year-old Stephen Blessy, who was on a semester abroad from Georgia's Kennesaw State University. Blessy's father said that when he called his son, a policeman who had found his phone answered. I can't tell you the pain that is. I wish I would have not let him go. So many parents, I'm sure, sharing that sentiment are thanks to Matt Gutman. We are now just eight days away until the midterm elections with candidates making their closing arguments on the campaign trail and both sides are bringing out the heavy hitters as the battle for control of Congress hits the final stretch. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. The 44th president of the United States, Barack Obama. In the final stretch of the midterms, Democrats are turning to former President Barack Obama to bring it home. Barack Obama! Obama heading to three states that could decide control of the Senate. Hello, Detroit! Obama making the case for Democrats on the economy. In Milwaukee, campaigning for Democrat Mandela Barnes, insisting incumbent Ron Johnson would end Social Security. He's called Social Security a Ponzi scheme. Said that, that it's candy that the left is giving away. Some of your parents are on Social Security. Some of your grandparents are on Social Security. You know why they have Social Security? Because they worked for it. They had long hours and sore backs and bad knees to get that Social Security. And if Ron Johnson does not understand that, if he understands giving tax breaks for private planes more than he understands making sure that seniors who've worked all their lives are able to retire with dignity and respect, he's not the person who's thinking about you and knows you and sees you, and he should not be your senator from Wisconsin. For Republicans, former President Donald Trump is on the trail, hitting four states this week, including two battlegrounds. They're crushing your oil and gas jobs, imposing massive taxes and restrictions on the American energy production and population. They're destroying your jobs and destroying our country. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, both former presidents are traveling to the all-important state of Pennsylvania later on this week, a sign of just how critical that state remains. Give us a sense of where that race stands tonight. Yeah, and the numbers really tell the story here. Of course, 538 has been tracking it all, and polls show that the Republican Dr. Mehmet Oz and the Democrat John Fetterman are polling within just one point of each other. Most of that polling taken before that critical debate, but there is so much on the line right there in Pennsylvania, Lindsay. All right, we know it. We'll be watching. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Pennsylvania will, of course, be a critical contest next week, but there are several Western states that could also help decide who controls the Senate, which have gotten less attention. So ABC's Martha Raddatz hit the road to talk to voters in Nevada, Colorado, and Utah to see what's driving their vote. And the economy and inflation were top of mind. Here's ABC's Martha Raddatz. Across Nevada's rural desert landscapes to the bright lights of Las Vegas roars a bitter fight for control of the Senate. They're running around peddling conspiracies and lies about an election that they claim was stolen that wasn't. We're doing this to save Nevada and save our great country. Nevada's Trump-backed former Attorney General Adam Laxalt. And there's no one more trustworthy in Nevada than Adam Laxalt. Who helped lead Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election results in Nevada, facing off with Democratic incumbent Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, the first Latina in the U.S. Senate. But Cortez Masto, with her low key style, is seen as one of the most endangered Senate Democrats in the nation. Because despite the fiery rhetoric about 2020, this race comes down to the economy. The economy, inflation, that's a big issue with you. Why? Because the prices have gone so high. All over Nevada, but especially here in Las Vegas, there were massive job losses during the pandemic because, after all, Las Vegas is all about hospitality, hotel jobs, restaurant jobs, and not all of those jobs have come back. When we won, we win! Ted Papa George leads the Culinary Workers Union, one of the largest in Las Vegas, launching a massive effort to get out the vote. All right, we vote! 
So far, the union has knocked on some 700,000 doors, encouraging registered voters to go to the polls and support Cortez Masto. The voters that may make the difference for the Democrats, Latinos, who account for roughly 20 percent of registered Nevadans and a whopping 60 percent of the Culinary Workers Union. Even if Cortez Masto wins in the heavily Latino areas, Laxalt is still confident of victory. Across the border into Colorado, you hear the same familiar echo from voters. It is not the 2020 election or the divided nation. Probably economies followed closely, real closely by the border. Incumbent Democrat Senator Michael Bennett, who's seeking a third term, is fending off Republican Joe O'Day, a Denver businessman selling himself as a fresh face in politics. My campaign's been focused on one issue. And it's inflation, inflation, inflation. O'Day describes himself as the Republican Joe Manchin, and he supports abortion access and has incurred the wrath of Donald Trump for accepting the 2020 election results. But a Republican hasn't won a Senate seat in Colorado in nearly a decade. And Democrats are fighting hard to convince voters they can help families. Bennett touting recent legislative wins. I've led the fight for the biggest tax cut ever for working families. Nationwide, Democrats are playing up social issues. Bennett, no different. He's put abortion at the forefront of his campaign. Mary Keene is so passionate about the issue, she's already voted straight party ticket. I don't agree with anybody telling me what I can do with my body. So basically the Democrats say they're not going to mess around with my decisions and so I just voted for them. But Democrats across the border in Utah will not have such a clear choice of candidates because there isn't one. That anyone is even talking about the Utah Senate race at this point is astonishing in itself. Utah is a blazingly red state. Utahns have elected only Republicans to the Senate for nearly 50 years. So the Democrats have a plan. Instead of putting up a candidate who would almost certainly get trounced by incumbent Mike Lee, they are throwing their support behind former Republican and now independent candidate Evan McMullen. The politics of division and extremism are tearing our country apart, turning Americans against each other. A former presidential candidate, McMullen, would need to bring Democrats, independents, and Republicans into his camp. But incumbent Mike Lee knows even with McMullen's surprising strength, he is a long shot. And like everyone we talked to, Utahns told us they just want someone who can fix inflation. A Republican rallying cry across the West, across the nation, that aims right at the Democrats' most vulnerable spot. Inflation in the economy important across the country. Our thanks to Martha Ranitz for that. Still to come, video shows the terrifying moments of bridge collapse in India, killing more than 100 people. Encouraging the next generation to speak up, activist Laura Corton tells us how she used her experience campaigning against a tampon tax to write a new guide to activism. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon. 
12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. In India, nine people are under arrest after the collapse of a pedestrian bridge that killed at least 130 people. Take a look at this disturbing video from a surveillance camera. You can see the bridge swaying, and then the moment it failed and threw people into the river below, authorities were able to rescue 177 survivors. The bridge collapsed just four days after it was reopened to the public after about seven months of renovations. In Brazil, a stunning defeat for the country's far-right leader, Jair Bolsonaro, widely called the Trump of the tropics. Leftist former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva edged out Bolsonaro by more than two million votes in a tightly contested race. There are fears Bolsonaro may falsely claim there is fraud in the election as a pretense to stay in power. Lula is expected to be sworn in January 1st. All visitors to Shanghai's Disney Resort were trapped inside today after the park suddenly suspended operations in order to comply with China's COVID-19 protocols after 10 new cases in Shanghai. To leave the park, those who were in, in attendance had to test negative for COVID. Park rides apparently continued to run while visitors were trapped inside. Laura Corrington launched the international campaign against tampon tax, which gathered more than a quarter of a million signatures and has led to changes both in the United Kingdom and European laws. In her book, Speak Up, Corrington writes an empowering, honest, and timely guide to activism for women and children brought up in the age of the internet and social media, exploring what it means to stand up for what you believe in. Speaking now, up to us is the author of the book, Miss Laura Corrington. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Laura, your campaign against the tampon tax changed laws and inspired similar campaigns in other countries. How did you decide what to incorporate in this book from your campaign? And also, what inspiration um, you took from other campaigns like Me Too? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, and this is essentially a book that I kind of wish I had when I was younger. Mm. And I think if I had had this book, I would maybe have campaigned a lot earlier. Um, mm. I think a lot of young people, especially when I go into schools and speak to kids, they feel like they can't make changes. You know, they're not old enough to vote. How can they be old enough to campaign? Um, but of course, anyone can campaign at any age, and especially young people who have an insight into the problems that they face and how to solve them. And you write, political changes don't have to be large, they can be everyday actions. Explain some of your everyday things that, that young readers can do to feel empowered. Uh, there's so many things, from conversations with each other about things like periods to tackle period stigma, or about healthy understandings of consent, which is something that we don't talk enough about. Um, yeah, so many conversations can be had that can have real impact, real difference, um, as well as lobbying like your school governing body, for example, to implement free period products in the bathrooms or to have an anti-harassment policy on campus to reduce the sexual harassment that kids face in school. Um, there are so many smaller acts that are so powerful and make a big difference that we kind of sometimes overlook for the bigger campaigns that change national laws. The book also tackles themes like feminism, consent, as you just mentioned, body positivity, social media, internet trolls. What advice do you have for teens who want to start those conversations more openly with their own peers? Get to go for it and to see what change you can make. This amount of ripples that have happened, even just from the tampon tax campaign, which started in my bedroom when I was a student, um, just, you know, with an online petition. Um, and the amount of change that we've managed to make um, kind of hopefully shows that other people could also make a lot of changes, especially online, especially today. And I'm sure now really is an exciting time for a number of reasons, but there are a lot of people, parents in particular, who may feel reluctant to bring up certain topics with their teenagers, like period, poverty, consent, and relationship taboos. What advice do you have for how to have those more difficult conversations? It means so much to a young person for their 
grandparents or parents to just talk openly about these topics and to just really listen to their experiences, their concerns and their anything that's on their mind to do with those to do with those areas. Um, so yeah, just having those open and honest conversations is so important to learn from your child as well as trying to teach them um, is also really important. And I just think, yeah, just have putting the bat on the table and just kind of going for it is really important. And um, even though it can be a little bit difficult and some people kind of feel a little bit embarrassed about talking um, about these topics, the more you talk about it, the more open you'll feel and the more you'll want to talk about it as well. And that, yeah, line of communication is so important for kids to raise any problems they have. Um, and at the moment, you know, a lot of young people feel like they can't talk about consent, they can't talk about periods, and then a lot of people suffer in silence and they can't overcome the problems that they're facing when actually they would be able to had they been able to have those conversations. And the final chapter of Speak Up is devoted to the next generation of young activists. What advice do you have for young girls and, and women who would like to, to follow in your path? And, and just the, the takeaway that you're hoping that, that, that young readers will, will get from this book. So I'm hoping that young people get from this book that they really can make changes, no matter how big, no matter how small, that hopefully these will give them the practical tools to doing that, as well as hopefully building their confidence. Um, also, I hope they take away that failing at something isn't necessarily a failure completely. Um, the tampon tax, for example, campaign that I ran had so many failures throughout the petition that you really don't often hear about in the media because obviously media kind of picks up on the positives the successes um which means that young people when they start campaigning the second they face a failure they think oh my whole campaign is going to fail which is not true at all um to keep going to be persistent through those you know pits and and everything else and um to have fun while they're doing it to keep focused and just yeah, hopefully this will kind of create a whole new wave of people who feel confident and have the tools to make the changes that they want to see in the world. Laura, we thank you so much for joining us. Speak Up will be available for U.S. readers to purchase starting tomorrow. Thank you. And still to come, there is a story behind each animatronic in this family's spooky display, but the most inspiring story of all belongs to the little boy who made it all come together. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News. World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. And finally tonight, Halloween holds a special meeting for a 10-year-old who spent the last two years fighting cancer. Jackson finished his treatment with just enough time to build a spooky display with his dad in their front yard. 42 characters are inside. They move, talk, even jump out to spook visitors. Reporter Alex Bazargian from our partner station WXYZ went to Royal Oak, Michigan to check out AJ's haunted experience. What was it like putting this all together? hard and very um, disruptive and it makes you angry because twice it blew over the season. When it comes to Halloween, Jackson Amick doesn't mess around. He spends all year collecting these spooky animatronics, each with their own story. So which one is your favorite? Uh, probably oh! this, this, 
Um, probably this guy, which is smoldering ghoul from Menards. The creatures clearly do a lot of the scaring, but Jackson picks up a shift every now and then. The lively 10-year-old had a rough couple of years. He was diagnosed with leukemia and spent 26 months in treatment at Beaumont Hospital. To begin the treatment um, is very, very frightening for him and for his mom and dad. Amick says Jackson spent most of his time planning this display. It gave him something to look forward to when things got rough. You know, with some kids, maybe it's athletics or the like that gives them the strength and motivation. Um, he works very hard at this. He loves it. He's very proud of it. So even when you were in the hospital, you were getting treatment, all you could think about was Halloween. Yes. <laughs> the whole year. Yes. For Jackson, Halloween is a way of life, and he loves bringing people to the dark side. So I want them to have a full experience of for Halloween, because like people pay money for their costumes, they pay money for the candy. Speaking of money, as you can imagine, building this is a financial commitment. We'll typically probably bypass one weekend vacation or a four or five day vacation each year because of what we'll do with animatronics and the like. So when you grow up, do you want to do something that's related to Halloween? Um, probably own like a Halloween pop-up store or just keep on doing this. Yeah, it'd be fun. Super impressive, Jackson, and happy Halloween. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change.